back to the show. I'm here with Christian Taylor. Hey. Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> and Sky Gatelli. Hello, Phil. Hi. We're here to talk about all the latest and greatest news from the world of Christian-y stuff. And the Jelly Telly app is out. So if you haven't downloaded it yet, go to the iTunes store and download the Jelly Telly app. Okay? Right now. Why are you rushing? Because we got to get going because our director has to go somewhere. Because we spent the half, last Cause, half cause hour We were trying in to start silliness. and it didn't go very well. No, so it didn't. We're still trying to and start. Because you were making apart. me laugh so hard, Mike. Captain Kirk says, time to start. What was his line? Was it time. Captain Kirk's line? Yeah. It wasn't, oh, that was time it. to start. No, the other no. one was engage or... Yeah, that was... That, that was Picard. Yeah. Oh, no. Engage. He didn't have a line. Spock. Spock. Um, I'm going to do the theme song. It's Captain Kirk. We No, we started going through the many voices of Larry the Cucumber last week. Yes, so we I did. figured it's only natural to continue that historical journey. Fabulous. So You the, started with the initial I one. I started with show one, Larry. So this is show two, Larry. When he gave up on Soupy, the, the bass voice, and changed to a squeaky, um, but kept his lisp. So this is modern Larry with lisp. Larry version 2, V 2.0. Larry 2.0. <clears throat> you with me? Hi, kids. I'm Bob the Tomato, and I'm Larry the Cucumber. Hey, it's the podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's the podcast. So there's no video. Hey, it's the podcast. So lend an ear. So fill with your podcast starts right here. We'll talk to Sky and Christian, too, and maybe a guest, but we don't have one here for you. That's not really Larry, but it's the best I can do. Hey, it's a podcast, the Linden here. The Phil Victor podcast starts right here. The Phil Victor podcast starts right here. Remember, God made you special and I love you very much. And so does Daffy Duck. <laughs> Goodbye. He didn't say that, did he? Did he say God made the you Daffy special? Duck. Oh, I, I, I would Bob. trade it off. I would, oh. I would say one of them would say the first half and the other one would say the second half. I, I changed oh, it. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> then they both say, Bye. Remember that part? I do remember that part. How they both say bye? Yes. Yeah. In unison. And, and we had to synchronize it. Mm. It's very hard. It, do they still do all this now? Yeah, more or less. I haven't watched a yeah. Veggie Tales uh, it's been, it's since been you while. left. <clears throat> it's been a while since you've been gone. Okay, uh, we got to start out because we got a lot to do. We got a lot to cover. And Bill, the, the director, has to leave. So we have to cram like a, an hour show into seven minutes. <laughs> but So we have to talk fast. <clears throat> Um, billboards. There's billboards. more news from the world of Christian billboards. Did you know that? Well, I know that we had some people comment on your Facebook page, and there were a couple that were pretty funny. Yeah, there were a couple of people that had some interesting stuff, but something crazy happened. A christian billboard war broke out in Times Square. Did you really? Did in you? Times Square. Yeah, Times Square. Yeah. Those like are, after our podcast? Yeah. Like Is it because of, of our podcast? No, 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 no. The epicenter of bill, billboards. Billboard you mean we were ahead of the curve with you that? Yeah, like animal wow. husbandry. That's billboardry, <clears throat> Times Square billboardry, okay. like husbandry. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, have you ever heard of the group Answers in Genesis? I've heard of them. Yes. It's a conservative Christian group. Slightly. Somewhat, somewhat conservative, founded by Ken Ham. They have picked up the mantle because atheists, uh, American atheists and the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the FFR, um, have been putting up billboards, anti-religious billboards around Christmas time and other holidays, and it's and it's making some people cranky. <clears throat> so Ken Ham and our friends at Answers in Genesis have taken up the I don't know baton, the uh, can mantle, of, can of mace, whatever it is, to engage in this heated <clears throat> the holy bludgeon, the, <laughs> the holy bludgeon, the holy bludgeon of Calcutta, the messianic mace. What was the uh, the the you're, um, you're on a roll, yeah. messianic mace? That's good. Uh, yeah. You could probably sell that. Maybe probably could. messianic Jews. What would what would go with atheists? Like well, what's the, what the holy hand grenade of of what in Monty Python Holy Grail? Say, whole, uh, bring out the holy hand grenade of from the second book of Alma. And remember they read yes, from yeah, the, I know, but it's, the, it's it from a, a, a town. It's from a yeah, city. Arimathea, something, no, like, something like that. Yeah, something that like was that. from the Bible. Yeah, but it's from Monty Python too. It's a parody because <laughs> they were going to go after the, the rabbit. So, so to 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 strike back at the uh, angry billboardering, they decided to atheists. hug them and love them and have a hug out. They uh -oh. they put up on on a big electronic billboard in Times Square where it rotates between multiple signs, so it's not as expensive. Um, they put one up that on, it's a two sided thing, and on one side it says to our atheist friends. 
and then you go around the corner and it says, thank God you're wrong. Oh. And then at the bottom, wow. AnswersInGenesis.org. So you can go you and, and read friends. more. friends. Thank God you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. What a backhanded billboard. It's, but it's, 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 it's friends, our, to our friends. That you're, 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 you're wrong, you're like, our you're like, friends. You're like holding out your hand and slapping them with the other? I don't like that. Maybe a little bit. Okay, so within 48 hours of that appearing, oh boy. the Freedom From Religious Foundation had composed a response billboard and got it into cycle on the same billboard, nice. the same electronic billboard. This one <laughs> has a sign of the times. Yeah. Uh, do you know who Julie Sweeney is? Julia Sweeney? No. I do she not. was on Saturday Night Live at one point. Oh, yeah. Do you recognize her? That's what she looks like. See, Bill's going to show a picture I to don't. everyone at home. I remember. She's she didn't have gray hair. Uh, but yeah. she wrote a play. She's now an atheist. She wrote a play uh, called Letting Go of God. So the freedom from religion. No, we're not. Oh, I thought you were going to ding that. We're not dinging I already the, dinged the atheist play. No, I dinged him. Oh, not the play. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So they put up a billboard picture of Julia Sweeney with the line, OMG, there is no God. Julia Sweeney, actress, comedian, playwright, letting go of God. I guess the notion is she's a celebrity. Although, so she's an authority. So she's an authority. And she's a comedian, which means she's funny. She's funny and if you're funny, you're right. That's one of our founding beliefs in America. Well, that's your whole premise for existence. That, <laughs> Ooh, way to turn that around. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh. Way to use your humor to try to deify my humor. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, so now we have, so these billboards are in rotation. They're like cycling against each other. To our atheist friends, thank God you're wrong, and Julia Sweeney, OMG, there is no God. You know what I like about the atheist one? What? It's basically just stating their own opinion. It's not talking directly back to the Christians. Yeah, it's not like, you know, Christians, you're idiots or something. To our Christian friends, like, wake up. The other ones that they've put up, though, all over New York... Are are uh, you the you know it's a myth series? Okay. So you know at Christmas time they put up a picture of the manger scene with you know it's a myth. Um, speaking of which, they attempted to put up in uh, Salt Lake City because this year, guess where the American atheists are having their national convention? Hmm. Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City. Ding 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 ding. Thank you. What do I get? Where's my? Where's my? Uh, you don't get anything. No. Um, so they wanted to put up billboards. Yeah. And the billboard they wanted to put up is a picture of a, a an attractive young woman, and next to it it says mother teacher, milita- military veteran. I'm Susan Smith and I'm a Mormon, except then Mormon is crossed out. And it says, I'm Susan Smith and I'm an ex-Mormon, except ex-Mormon is then crossed out. And then it says, I'm Susan Smith and I'm an atheist. <gasps> dup, dup, dum, because the Mormon church yeah. has done a big campaign of I'm a Mormon billboards. And so this is their response well, to that. Th- but, <clears throat> but the American atheists are complaining because no billboard company in Salt Lake City <laughs> will post it. They won't put it What up. a shock. Because they're all owned by Mormons. And so they or say... Or if they're not, they depend on Mormons for their, yeah. for their uh, income. What this really communicates to us is the stranglehold that the Mormon church has on the community in Utah. You think? I think that's where Utah came from. Mm-hmm. Said David Moscato, American Atheist Public Relations Director. Hey, he's a new public relations director because I, I was on a talk show with the old one and that's not his name. Um, it reminds me of the mafia in Italy. They don't even have to make threats. People just know that they're supposed to be afraid. Hmm. That's an assumption, isn't it? <laughs> kind of is. <laughs> I think it is definitely, <clears throat> definitely assumption. So uh, well, these are the latest <clears throat> billboard boards. So here's my question. Is it working? Is anyone <clears throat> Well, that's my question. Anything? Is, they put up these billboards rotating in, in Times Square. What are they looking for? What is the outcome? What are they measuring? What's the metric? Is it? it, it uh, here's my hunch. Yeah. I think what they're measuring is how much more money do we get donated to our cause? Maybe. Because I Maybe. don't know who's going to look at any of well, those billboards and go, oh, yeah, I'm going to now you know, be a what, Christian. Well, well, I'm going to be what an atheist. The, what the atheist groups are looking for, and it's similar to uh, PETA's strategy. Who's PETA? Uh, People for Ethical Treatment of Animals. I the, thought you meant the Hunger PETA? Games guy. The animal rights. She, he just wanted me to say it. Okay. Um, what they're looking for is that they have very little money for advertising, for getting their message out. So if they buy one well-placed billboard that is provocative enough, 
the news media pick it up. Right. And it's ba- the same thing as a national TV campaign. Or the so, Phil Vischer show. Yeah. Ex- this, yeah. Is, this is the whole point is to get, they want the Phil Vischer pimple that we discussed last week <laughs> instead of the Stephen Colbert bump. Um, so but what, what they've accomplished, yes. Well, so what I wonder is, I do think that, in my opinion, the atheist community does feel like that religion is sort of the root of all ills in society in terms of, you know, the Some wars. Mostly et Richard Dawkins. Okay. And that they really want to challenge people to think about, you know, what they believe and cause a, a you know, a bigger debate in the public square. About it. I also think they want to normalize atheism, which is why you do the billboard like the one in Utah. Yeah, when they talk about it openly, what they're really talking about is trying to get atheists to feel comfortable coming out of the closet, Mm -hmm. which is why, you know, Bill Maher Coming out of the sacristy. (laughs) Called atheism uh, the next gay marriage. Right. You know, it's trying to get people to come out and say, by golly, I am an atheist, which is why one of the atheist groups has actually made a ministry quote unquote, of helping uh, Christian pastors acknowledge mm-hmm. that they're atheists and then leave the pastorate and find a new life. Do you think there should be an agnostic billboard in there somewhere? We have no idea. Well, I just think it's... Actually, no, that's not an inspiring message that But I think anyone. it's a more honest one. Yeah, but who wants to donate money to fund that billboard? I, you know, somebody wants to do, donate money to say it's okay to not be sure. Yeah. Are you going to fund no, it? No, I'm not going to fund it. Do you know I'm anyone say, who would? It, what it does is it creates a false belief that you, you can only be, yeah, and yeah. that you have to be on one side of this or the other. You can't be right. anywhere else. Right. And, and it's funny because both sides have the same criticism is that the other side is so certain. Mm-hmm. You know, the other side, oh, they're so, their religious belief is ridiculous because they say they know this. They know this. <laughs> you know, but the, on the same, on the flip side, they're doing mm-hmm. the same thing. You know it's a myth. You know it's not true. Yeah, so we all we all are too obsessed with certainty. Well, and I don't think it'd be very interesting to get into a war with ag- agnostics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they'd just be like, "Well, I don't know." <laughs> but what what else can be but said? That's the thing is, you can't hey, get in a war with them. Hey, you got a point. I don't really care. You could be right. I don't really. I, know, I think I there's, really there's, there are principled agnostics. There's actually a term called holy agnosticism. Yeah? What's really? that? We want yeah. to explain? Oh, gosh. I wrote about it in my first book, and I can't remember who said it. <laughs> uh, it was one early church. Father. Anyway, holy agnosticism is actually a Christian idea that says, um, I know there's a God, but I just, you got to begin from the basis that I can't really know anything about him apart from what he chooses to reveal. So okay. you, you go in there very open-handed. So it's kind of a sanctified but agnosticism. But you're still saying yes. your, ba- exactly. your premise is, I know there's a God. Well, yeah, but it's, it's, it's a humble... Re- the opposite is the, the absolute certainty about everything. Right. We have it completely figured out. Right. We know exactly how to interpret Genesis. We know everything. And we know how God would vote. Exactly. We know everything about and what God thinks And which sports about team he would want and to win. And by the way, his views always conform perfectly to my own. That's usually a dangerous posture to be in. Yeah. The opposite, though, of course, is the atheists who say, well, we know exactly everything also, and it doesn't right. include God, and that's not... Do you right. know who invented, who coined the term agnostic? Who? Do you know? Do you know? I don't know. Do you know? Do you know? No, I don't. Darwin's bulldog. Huxley. What? What? Yeah. It was a response to, okay, we now have Darwinism, and so now you could... It's technically, you, maybe God didn't do anything. Some people were saying, so there is no God. And he said, no, we can't know that. You can't prove a negative. Mm-hmm. So you can't prove there is no God. So at best, you can just say we don't know. Um, Richard Dawkins in his book, uh, The God Delusion, which I just finished reading, and it's not a very good book, but, you know, we'll ring the bell anyway. Uh, takes exception to that and says, no, you can't know. Okay, Huxley was right that you can't, not Aldous Huxley, but his brother. Uh, you can't, or his father, uh, you can't know for sure that there is or isn't a God, but you can run a probability analysis. And so his, the whole point of his book is, is not to say there is no God, but to say that the idea of God is highly improbable and therefore should be rejected. So he doesn't like, the, he thinks agnostics are kind of chicken that they wimp out because they don't want to offend people. And that's really his. I'm sure that's his, true for some. 
You think there are some chicken agnostics? There's probably some chicken agnostics. Are there agnostic chickens? <laughs> yeah, they come from agnosticism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, speaking of speaking of atheists, uh, you know, last week Hobby Lobby made uh, the Jews a little cranky. We, yeah, talked, we talked about, about that. that. Yeah. yeah. This week, uh, Oprah Winfrey made atheists a little cranky. Yes. Really? Did what you hear about yes. that? No. Has Re- anyone ever been cranky at Oprah Winfrey before? Has she ever actually taken a well, position? I think she's been to court a few times. Yes, I do. Over the beef thing. That's I true. That. She made the beef growers, the cattlemen of mm-hmm. Texas, cranky with they her. They had a beef. They had a beef. Oprah Winfrey had um, Diane uh, Diana Nyad, you know her? No, who is she? She's the swimmer. The swimmer, the long-distance swimmer who finally, oh, after like her. 30 years of trying, successfully swam from Cuba to the U.S. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Uh, she was on Oprah, sat down okay. for a one-hour show. It was supposed to be a touchy-feely kind of a thing. And it got a little bit interesting because during the hour-long segment, Diana Nyad declared herself an atheist. She then explained, I can stand at the beach's edge with the most devout Christian, Jew, Buddhist, go on down the line and weep with the beauty of this universe and be moved by all of humanity, all the billions of people who have lived before us, who have loved and hurt and suffered. So to me, my definition of God is humanity and is the love of humanity. And then Oprah said, well, I don't call you an atheist then. I think if you believe in the awe and the wonder and the mystery, then that is what God is. That is what God is. It's not a bearded guy in the sky. Uh, Diana Nyad reiterated that she did not believe in God and was an atheist. And it sparked a bit of a firestorm online for Oprah not letting Diana Nyad say she was an atheist. Wow. Was Diana mad? Um, she, she repeated her position at the end. I don't know if she's jumped into it since then, uh, but Boston atheists uh, launched a Twitter and Facebook campaign to get Winfrey to officially apologize, basically by saying, you're saying that atheists can't be filled with awe and wonder. That, if, that awe and wonder. And what amazes me through all of this is how incredibly squishy Oprah Winfrey's definition of God is. Mm-hmm. You know, that she, uh, w- when you first sent this article, I thought for sure as I started reading it, it was going to be Christians who were upset at Oprah because her definition of God was so squishy. So stupid. But it's the atheists who are upset with her. You because, call it stupid? Because yeah. she yeah. calls their sense of awe and wonder, that's God. Yeah, yeah, with the mystery of life. Right. That's God. The mystery well, at of this life. Point, what the really? heck is that? At this point, it, it, yeah, but it you know mean what? anything. Look, most people, like you have said, reinvent God to who they think he is. It was Voltaire. You, oh, you didn't say that. Well, I'm quoting Voltaire. He said yeah. that God, in the beginning, God created man in his own image, and then man returned the favor. But, yes. was, but was he quoting someone? Well, the first half, he was quoting Genesis. Well, maybe, maybe he heard someone else say that. He could have. Does it matter? Because there's nothing new. Now Christian is saying it. Yeah, now I'm saying so it. So quote Christian. Oh, okay, okay, Christian My says, point is. This guy says, Voltaire says, <laughs> Voltaire's cleaning lady says. And his bulldog, maybe. <laughs> his, his atheist bulldog. <laughs> How did, wait, we didn't, you didn't finish about the atheist bulldog. No, no, no that, I did. That was, it, it was Darwin's Huxley. bulldog is, is Huxley. Was the guy who defended Darwin? They called him Darwin's They bulldog. called him Darwin's bulldog. I was thinking was he was a nickname. real bulldog. No, wait, no, Darwin I, did not I, have a real bulldog. He, he was a bulldog, but he evolved I into Huxley. Figure that out. <laughs> he had a pretend bulldog. <laughs> yeah. Okay, gosh. Okay, now we can move on. I really thought yeah. I didn't yeah. figure we out how that was We are not returning to the story of Darwin's bulldog. Okay, good. That story has been told. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it sounds like she's just you know reinventing. Her definition of who it's, God is. We are. We're so wimpy. I mean, it seems quite a jump to say to go from the two choices for what God is are an old bearded man in the sky, so an overly personified, you know, anthropomorphized God, or awe and wonder at the universe. Right. Could it possibly be that there's something in the middle that might have a little more doctrine around it than? Then, then cartoon, you know, and the, and that same cartoon is actually what what some of the atheists use, you know, to mock belief in God. Sure. So you think there's a bearded man in the sky that makes everything happen and made a snake talk and did all this crazy stuff? I, I'm going to side with the atheists on this one. Which atheists? These atheists. Oh, against Oprah? Yeah. I kind of am too. Yeah, I am too. Because, you know, the fact that that, uh, Diane, is that her name? Yeah, Diana Diana. Nyad. I used to think it was Diane Anayad, but it's not. It's Diana Nyad. Okay. The fact that Diana... Isn't Nyad like a tree sprite? Yeah, that was from Narnia. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. 
But she's, she, a, she's, she's a water, a water sprite. She's a water sprite, right. <laughs> Except she keeps getting jellyfish stings. Okay. I'm stopping. Lips. Time oh, out. Although she Let does him look finish more his like thought. a tree. Please, go um, on. Because if you don't okay, finish it, so I'm going to No, here's it. the thing. If Diana looks out at the ocean and has this sense of awe and wonder and all that, I don't, I don't think that that means there's a god. I think no. what that means is that she has she, awe and wonder. Is that she's human? <laughs> is she recognizes how g- gosh darn big the ocean is? Yeah, and, and how many people? They but have. I will agree with Oprah on this: that that sense of of smallness and finiteness and insignificance in this in the presence of creation yeah. is really the beginning of of genuine worship. Oh. I agree but, with that. But also. that alone is not what makes. <laughs> but I'll tell you where I theist. side with the atheists here, which is a little different than you, and that is that, you know, Oprah is supposed to be the interviewer, you know, asking Diana who she is, what she thinks, how she accomplished this, and you know, letting her talk about who she is and what she believes. And yeah. Oprah just basically made it about Oprah and what she believes, well, which is what is Oprah a, does. Oprah is the spiritual leader of many millions. She's Oprah. Pope, true. Oprah. True. Did Voltaire say that, or no, is that Sky? No, that's me. I said oh, that. Right. I just think it was inconsiderate, so I side with yeah, the atheists. Yeah. All about right. That. Oprah Winfrey, you owe Diana Nyad an apology, and all the atheist jellyfish that tried to sting her lips while she swam. <laughs> They're all insulted by that. Okay. Uh, Christian movies. I have something to say about Christian movies. Lay it on us. What a shock. <laughs> this is coming from. <laughs> and I thought we were going to talk about Japan. We are going to talk about Japan. We're all in good time. Wait, wait a second. We had one more billboard we had to talk about. Oh, there was the one with me on it. Yeah, yeah. that was my yeah, favorite. Do you have that one? Yeah, somebody I, I do sent have this in. A fan sent this yeah. in. They were driving well, fan, somewhere. Who is it? What fan Bill, is this? Bill, this, put this? it up on screen. Okay, good. Are we looking at it? Brandon Harris sent this to me. He's a genius. We were, we were messaging back and forth on Facebook, and he sent this to me, and he, and he said to me very kind of shyly that, hey, I made this. And I'm a little worried that Phil won't like it or would be bothered by it. I am mortally offended. I'm as offended as an atheist at an Oprah rally. And I I was looking (laughs) at it on my phone, and I was right next to Amanda, my wife, and we were both dying laughing. (laughs) And then I texted him back. I just said, no, 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 Phil will love this. And I I hate it. It's really well done. And and actually, you make a pretty good Forrest Gump. You do. I do, don't I? Yeah. Except your head's a little big. That sort of That's what makes it funny. I have that Gumpian gumpian innocence. Well, are we going to show this? Yeah, it'll be up on this. Yeah, build just showed it to everyone. Didn't you? Did you miss that? It says, in case you're listening. So who made that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Life is like a moving sidewalk, and it shows Phil in the Forrest Gump kind of poster on the, on the bench, bench with the box with of the chocolates. chocolates. Uh, and he says, you're born on one end, and you just slide along till you get to the other end, and you die. <laughs> and then at the bottom, in small type, it has a hashtag... End of Western civilization as we know it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we it's have uh, awesome fans. I brilliant. love our Keep fans. Keep sending in so the fun, creative, goofy, creative stuff. I'm we love y'all. Girl. Y'all rock. And now that you have images of us from the podcast video, you can do all kinds of weird things. Oh, okay. don't, don't, don't give them <laughs> sure. that leeway, please. <laughs> <laughs> Two movies that I want to mention oh, briefly right. that we need to keep our eyes on. One we almost mentioned last week, but then we didn't. Um, Darren uh-huh. Aronofsky's Noah. Oh, is, right. Is now being screened. It's actually being screened. Do you know who Darren Aronofsky is? Somebody that made a movie called Noah. Well, yeah. You Isn't know what like I, a Russian mogul that has like golden n- little giraffes? No. N- no, no. <laughs> I think there's a there is a, a a Russian oligarch. Yeah. I think is the word in in that circle. Um, he's a filmmaker. He made the two films. Uh, he best known for the Wrestler that put Mickey Rourke back on the map. Okay. And the Black Swan. I haven't seen either one of those, but no, they're both what you would call hard R. Oh, for sexuality, R. Yeah, I stay away from those. Hard R R for sexuality, including in the Black Swan, uh, uh, some lesbian sexuality. I was very confused. I didn't see either movie, but I was confused because there's a book called The Black Swan. That's different. But it's completely different yeah, than the movie. Yeah, it has nothing to do with yeah. Because I read the book and was like, are they making a movie? So, so he's known for extremely edgy, uh, fairly sexualized kind of art house style films. And then it was announced, he's going to make Noah. He's, not- and my first thought was, this is going to go very poorly. <laughs> Does anyone not know? Because somewhere in the studio, and it's uh, Paramount, uh, uh, no, Fox. No, Paramount. 
somewhere in the studio, someone is saying, Noah, those Christians will love this. Mm-hmm. They'll all come out because well, we're did throwing that them Almighty a bone. A couple years ago. Yeah, which actually didn't work. No. And, and it led, I liked led it. to Universal Studios saying they would never try another Christian movie. Really? I liked that movie. I know, but it failed. It doesn't matter whether or not you like it, Christian. It matters how much well, money Why did it, it fail? Because not enough people went out to see it. Because it wasn't a very good movie. Well, it wasn't that good. It wasn't terrible. But it, it wasn't that good. It ruined the story of Noah. Okay. I, okay. So okay. So anyway, your point they're is gonna tr- they want to tap the Christian market by making a Noah movie, and they yes. got so so they this pick director Darren Aronofsky. Terrible choice, um, but it's it's off a script based on a graphic novel, so it's actually an edgy retelling of Noah to start out with. The funny thing is, okay, so this is what's happening, and they, and they cast Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe is Noah. Noah. So it, they're not telling the biblical story of Noah. They're telling. They're making a movie based on a novel. A graphic novel. A graphic novel. What does that mean? Noah. Like a comic Pictures. book novel. A, oh, a comic, I thought you meant it was like no. No, not graphically like, talking no, about not like a romance you know. novel. Didn't okay. he spill his seed, you know, the and Hollywood, he was disgraced the Hollywood in a drunken reporter, stupor? The Hollywood Reporter <laughs> reports that test screenings in New York, Arizona, and Orange County for Jewish, Christian, and mixed religious groups have been worrisome and troubling, <laughs> prompting Paramount to suggest changes to the movie. As you might expect, Aronofsky has not been receptive. So what's the issue? Apparently Apparently, it's the third act, which is being deemed a major challenge, particularly as the studio wants to find a way not to alienate the potentially huge Christian audience. And how much did this movie cost to produce? Um, it's at like 100, 100 million, 110 million. I mean, it's a big budget film. You know, the question is, do they have any Christians on their staff anywhere that they would vet this stuff to well, well, beforehand? Yeah, this, this writer says, the real surprise here is that Par- Paramount suddenly has a problem with the film. The material had already been published in graphic novel form. And moreover, details about its non-traditional take have been well known even before production began. As far back as 2011, Aronofsky's said, it's a great script and it's huge. It's a really cool project and I think it's really timely because it's about environmental apocalypse. (laughs) Noah was the first environmentalist. He's a really interesting character. Hopefully they'll let me make it. Noah was the first person to plant vineyards and drink wine and get drunk. It's there in the Bible. (laughs) He was the first person ever to do that? (laughs) Wow. The interesting thing in my mind is that which part? Of well, there's the many parts. There are many parts. <laughs> Which that part of your mind? Well, it seems to me that Paramount is making the same, or they made the same assumption that many Christians make. Ooh, Ooh what do you mean by that? The assumption that Darren, Darren Aronofsky could make a good movie for Christians? No. Okay. It's the assumption that... Because if you took your youth group to see Black Swan, I think that assumption <laughs> was probably disavowed. It's the assumption that if it's, if it's, a, if it's Bible... Or if it's Christian, yeah. or if it's you know a, a biblical character, then it must be true. That it must be appealing to. to Are you saying the Bible truth. isn't true? No, I'm saying there's a lot of stuff that is packaged as Christian or packaged as biblical and sold to Christians and then consumed oh. by Christians, well, and which pro- is actually has nothing to do with what Jesus taught. And they or think said it's or. probably not. They don't. You know, they think it's probably not a very discriminating audience. You know, if it's just Christian, then everybody will buy it. And they'll see it's, it's like Noah, and they'll be, they'll be happy about it. But th- that's a really bad. And assumption. they probably will get a lot of people in there. But I do think people are becoming a little bit savvier. Perhaps. The other thing I read about this story or the movie that kind of weirds me out a little bit is they didn't use any actual animals. They're all CGI. They're all, well, and they're all CGI, but they're also not fair real, re- real representations yeah. of actual animals. Because, of course, that was a long fantasy. time ago in evolutionary time, so they hadn't evolved to where they are now. Is that what No, I think it's, I think they just went with a fantasy kind of oh, world where, okay. you know, there's little giraffes mm. or something. Noah, I don't know, Noah riding unicorns? Something like that. This does not make me want to see the movie. It's not going to go well. Here's another movie, though, that could be fantastic, but I'm concerned. Okay. <clears throat> uh... <laughs> Sorry, I just, I just choked on my tea. There's a book called Unbroken, uh, written by Laura Hillebrand. Right. Uh, she wrote the book Sea Biscuit, that became a really good movie with what's that guy's name? What's his name? It was uh, it, it was um, Toby Maguire. Toby Maguire. Yeah, Toby yeah. Maguire. Spider Man. Well, it, it was a really good movie. Her next book was the life story. It's called Unbroken. The life story of Louis Zamperini. 
Okay, this is an absolutely amazing story that was first attempted to turn into a movie in 1957 with Tony Curtis as the lead, Ooh. and it didn't get made. But it's a guy, uh, Louis Zamperini was an Olympic sprinter. He was in, which Olympics were in Berlin? Was it the 36? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was 30-something. 24 was or Paris. 30, okay. Uh, so it's 36 Olympics. He was a sprinter. He didn't win that year because he was a little too young. But the next one, 40, he was training for, and he was favored to win the gold medal in his events. Um, war broke out. He went into the Army, uh, gets shipped to Hawaii. He's, he's on a plane, uh, crashes in the Pacific, and he and one other guy survive on a raft in the Pacific for 47 days, setting a new record for how long anyone had ever been adrift wow. and survived. The story of how they survived is just astonishing, first of all, like trying to catch seabirds with their bare hands to eat them. Is it like Life of Pi? Uh, it's like that, but way realer. Uh -huh. No tigers, but they're followed by sharks like all the way. They've just got this little group of sharks just waiting, and a Japanese plane shows up at one point, and this is all true. A Japanese plane shows up at one point, sees them, they're waving, help us. The Japanese plane strafes them with machine gun fire puts like 40 what? holes in their raft and then flies away. <laughs> which was Why? A, a vi Why? Because they were Americans. Well, maybe, but, yeah, but maybe. Which was a violation of the Geneva Convention, but that was beside the point. Yeah. So the raft is slowly deflating and sinking, and the sharks are starting to leap up on the <gasps> edges of the raft, and they're having. <laughs> it was just an incredible story. They ma they finally make it. They drift all the way to an island uh, that's occupied by the Japanese. Some nice Japanese guys kind of give them a little food and resuscitate them, but then look at them very sadly as they realize, now we have to turn you over to the authorities, and that's not going to be pretty. And then they're put in a, a prisoner of war camp in Japan under a highly sadistic uh, warden who picks out this Louis Zamperini because they, they've read press clippings about him. They realize he's kind of a, a celebrity and picks him out to break him. Um, and it's his battle against this warden to not be broken by him. Um, okay, so it's an amazing story. He ends up surviving, coming back to America. Um, Angelina Jolie has picked up the story and is going to direct it. It's her second movie she's going to direct. And is that the part that concerns you? Here's the part that concerns me. Okay, if you read the book, the most amazing part, the part that I did not see coming at all, uh, he gets back to America, um, can't adapt like a lot of people coming back from that kind of experience. Can't, what a shock. Can't just adapt back into regular life, falls into very serious alcoholism. His marriage is failing. So you want it to just be, yay, he's back. End of the book. Right. It's not the end of the book. His life is falling apart. He's alcoholic. Uh, his wife is about to leave him. Everything is falling apart. At the, at the prompting of his wife, he wanders into Billy Graham's first Los Angeles crusade. Ooh, I just got chills. Is completely saved, just radically uh -huh. accepts Christ, never touches alcohol again. Wow. Uh, turns his life around completely and spends the rest of his life building camps for, for kids, for underprivileged kids, and becomes this hero to like thousands and thousands of, of troubled kids. So here's the, that's how the book ends. <laughs> it, it reads like a, a Billy Graham movie. Yeah. Where he comes to faith, right. his life is turned around, and he does amazing work, and he's happy ever after. And the funny thing is the guy's still alive. There's actually a picture. He's in his 90s. He is? Yeah, he's still alive. There's a picture that just went up last week of Angelina Jolie hugging him because he's not. And she's. Uh, let me, so you, I need to see this. What is your concern? What the heck is she going to do with that part? Well, <laughs> why not just do it? Because it'll it'll play like it's a it's proselytizing. But, but, it'll, pro, it'll play like. Have you ever seen a, a gospel film from the gospel film company, the film company that Billy Graham started? No. Okay, well, they all end with a conversion that turns someone's life around. But if it's a true and, story, and if she and really he's still alive. tells it, if he, if she really tells it yeah. with integrity, oh, that would be incredible. Now, if Hollywood it could be really good, if Hollywood were writing the end from scratch, he would come back and like open a sushi sushi franchise or something, right? To, to, and make millions of dollars. Right. You would think but he would want to would, have, like, final approval think. of the script so, since he's alive. So Angelina said, it will, ha it will be hard to make a film worthy of this great man. I am deeply honored to have the chance and will do all I can to bring Louis's inspiring story to life. Everyone involved in the film shares this deep responsibility. Like all readers of Laura's book and all people who love and admire 
admire Louis. I am a fan who has learned so much. So has wow. she, how much has well, she learned? I, I think we should learned. withhold judgment. I here. agree. With so, I'm not judging. I'm saying I'm concerned. It's fine. I think I'm going to withhold my concern. There's, there's going to be a lot of pressure to we got to do something with that ending. But he's still alive. Yeah, and the yeah, book but, is there. If but people, at, it's been a bestseller. People look at, are going to know. Look if they at screw Duck around. Dynasty. You can't change. You know, them. look at Duck Dynasty. What? How much those guys want more Jesus in there, and they they won't let him oh, do it. They have gotten more Jesus in there every single episode. You must okay, not so, have been watching. So maybe my friend. they can do more in the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look. Here, I'm here's concerned. What, here's That's what I'm I think. saying. I'm concerned. I, I, I it, think is an ama- it is the most amazing story. It's like, it's almost unbelievable. You almost, it's like, you couldn't even make that up. And then to tack on an ending where he walks into literally a Billy Graham crusade and is radically saved and has his life turned around and never touches alcohol again and becomes a hero for kids. It's like, okay, that can't be true. Except it is true, what, but will they let it What if be? they don't even go that far? What if it just ends yeah, when he comes just, home from the war and he survives and he's unbroken? That would be depressing. That would be really depressing oh, for, for anyone who's read the book. Sure. Yeah, I wouldn't but be surprised I, if they do that. I, I don't know. Let's see, Angelina. Maybe she'll. You know, it, just it's it's go interesting. With the story. It, her response Maybe. to him sort of proves what I believe is true, which is it is. How can anyone argue if you have a Christian living in our society that's genuinely living like Christ? Yeah. How can that be bad? The problem is it doesn't fit with our current cultural narrative. Well. Religion makes people judgmental and mean. Right. And yeah, if but, you have someone. But she has encountered somebody. She has now, by yeah, her own words, yeah. has encountered somebody that knows Christ clearly by his but, life but because clearly, there's clearly he was an exceptional person before because of all his surviving and unbrokenness. So maybe the, you know. Maybe, Perhaps it was God that saved him for a special purpose. Maybe the, the alcoholism was just a little detour off his exceptionalism and then religion what? somehow I, snapped not, him out of it. What do you have to say about this guy? I'm not so concerned that they're going to make it into a secular story and remove all signs of religion or faith or his conversion, but it could totally be Oprah-fied. That's where, true. Where, yeah. where they still do the crusade, he still comes to faith, it's a conversion thing, but the way it's spun is, well, you know, this is spirituality is good, and this was his expression of spirituality right. that helped him get right. through his alcoholism. But right. it, the thing with our culture is I don't think it's as secular and atheistic as people think. It's still highly religious, and Oprah's a great example of that. She loves religion. She loves She's spirituality. Highly religious. But it's, it's pragmatic, self-help spirituality. Right. And wh- whatever helps you get by, great. Whatever helps me get by, great. But let's not talk about exclusivity okay. or anything like that. So let's keep an eye no, on that movie. Wait, wait. We've got something else to talk about, though. Yeah. But I have to introduce it with a song. Oh, <laughs> It's the end of Western civilization as we know it. Oh, and I feel fine. It's the end of Western civilization as we know it, and I feel fine. I love that. I didn't know you knew that song. Except we're talking about Japan. Yeah, but you know what? That's good. That it's going to happen it in ironic. the United States, it's not, too. It's not Western. That makes it ironic. All right. All right. Okay. It's okay. going to happen in Western civilization. First story civilization. into Western civilization. The end. It's coming. A New York man was seriously injured when a toilet exploded in his face after he pulled the handle to test the water pressure in his Brooklyn apartment. The 15-year-old, 58-year-old information technology specialist is now fearful, now so fearful, that he uses a rope to flush the toilet from behind the bathroom door <laughs> at a safe distance. That's like a scene from Ghostbusters. And this matters why? <laughs> His lawyer, Sanford Rubenstein, says those fears are part of his damages. Clearly, toilets are supposed to flush, not explode. <laughs> Who's he suing? He's suing the everyone. He's suing New York. Apparently, the water was turned off to the building and the pipes were full of air. And then they turned the water back on and some bizarre pressurization happened that the first time someone <laughs> in the building flushed a toilet, three of the toilets exploded. Exploded, literally exploded. Wow. Is that fun? Or, okay, that's not really the end of Western yeah, civilization. You really threw me for a loop. But there. I really like that. The real end of Western civilization is predicted by something that is happening in Eastern civilization. Mm. See, I'm bringing it all around. And if you have very small children listening to this podcast, yes. this story may not be appropriate for you. So you may want to listen to it by yourself first. Um, why have young people in Japan stopped? 
having sex. What happens to a country when its young people stop having sex? Japan is finding out. Japan's under 40s appear to be losing interest in conventional relationships. Millions aren't even dating, and increasing numbers can't be bothered with sex. For their government, celibacy celibacy syndrome, quote unquote, is part of a looming national catastrophe. Japan already has one of the world's lowest birth rates. Its population of 126 million, which has been shrinking for the past decade, is projected to plunge a further one-third by 2060. Um, A survey in 2011 found that 61% of unmarried men and 49% of women aged 18 to 34 were not in any kind of romantic relationship. Another study found that a third of people under 30 years old had never dated at all. Never. One-third of Japanese under the age of 30 have never even dated. That's a lot. That's nuts. Yeah. Um, And as they get into it, uh, um, an earlier survey found that 45% of women aged 16 to 24 were not interested in or despised sexual contact. Well, a lot of women in, you know, Western civilization would say that too. (laughs) Fewer babies were born in Japan in 2012 than any year on record, which was also the year, which I think we mentioned before on the podcast, uh, the remarkable year where the number of grown-up diaper sales exceeded the number of baby diaper sales for the first time in any Western not good. Or, or developed country ever. Um, Japan is, is starting to collapse on itself. Uh, lacking long-term shared goals, many singles are turning to what one woman terms pot noodle love. What's that? It's it's our first T-shirt, obviously. (laughs) Uh, Easy or instant gratification in the form of casual sex, short-term trysts, and the usual technological suspects, online porn, virtual reality, girlfriends, anime cartoons, or else they're opting out altogether and replacing love and sex with other urban pastimes. How is that pot noodle sex? I I have no idea. I don't get that. I don't know what that is. Uh, So one woman was quoted saying, I have a great life. I go out with my girlfriends, career women like me uh, to French and Italian restaurants. I buy stylish clothes and I go on nice holidays. I love my independence. Well, And the other stuff they bring up in the article is that the Japanese society has been set up in a way and government programs and such that it's incredibly expensive to raise children. It pretty much necessitates dual income. But Japanese women who are married and have children find it almost impossible to work. Because, because of the culture of work the culture in of Japan, work. which is, you know, 16-hour days. So they have essentially forced women to choose you either work or you stay home and have children, which is, right. and more and more of them are choosing to work. Whereas in more Western civilizations, policies have come in to make it easier for women to both work and have children or have lengthy maternity leave, things like that. But in Japan, they don't have that. So right. women are choosing right. to work <clears throat> and postpone what, or delay what, What's or never interesting is all the people that they interview in this that are single, that have no interest in marriage, no interest in children, and, and not really an interest in relationships, all talk about, um, I love to go out to eat. I love to buy stylish clothes. Mm-hmm. I love to go on holidays. It's all about yeah. consuming it's, 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 and yep. It self. is such a consumerist society that has kind of filled in, backfilled in with the absence of of religion. Yeah, because it's no longer a religious society and there's no emphasis on family. There's no emphasis um, on. And the other issue with with Japanese culture, which is kind of interesting, is how uh, homogeneous it is because there's very little immigration. Mm -hmm. You know, so ninety nine some percent of Japanese are Japanese. And when you have a a culture that that's that that is that uh, homogenized. If there's a trend in one part of it, like America is so diverse that you could have, you know, this group is just going nuts and they're never going to get married and they're never going to have children. But then you've got the Amish and then you've got the conservative Christians. And then but what are the African-Americans doing and what are and you got immigrants? Yeah. What are, the immigrant Latino population? What, so there's certainly a, there's a there's a balancing out across dip, different We've diversified our vices. We've diversified. So no single vice can destroy our yes, society. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So, you know, if if no if. If no gay people are having kids, well, that's okay because we've got all these people over here that are having twice as many kids. Japan is kind of the first example of what if an entire society stops having children 
What does it look like? And they've already, I'd, I'd read a story earlier uh, about uh, having to bulldoze several villages in Japan because no one lived there anymore. Wow. You know, and you can't leave them empty because there's too much crime, there's too much arson. If you want to see what, it, what Japan will look like in 40, 50 years, look at Detroit today because mm. the same thing is happening in Detroit where the population has dropped in half in the last 60 years, 75 years. And now they have, you know, they have twice as much city as they need for the population. And what starts to break down, first of all, are civil services like mm-hmm. police mm-hmm. and fire. They can't cover the whole territory. Um, but because we're, we're a democracy, you can't just say like in China, they would just solve the problem in China by saying you are all being relocated to Houston. <laughs> and we're just going to bulldoze Detroit. Well, in a democracy, it's really hard to do anything like that because people say, heck no, I won't go, you know, and then they have their representative representing them. So no one can do anything about it. So there's whole blocks in Detroit where there's maybe one person living on an entire block, but they won't move. So they can't bulldoze the block. Uh, there are like nine arsons a night in, in Detroit. Wow. People just wandering around setting things on fire. And no one, that's why the, t- the city just declared bankruptcy. So that's what happens when a population shrinks Mm -hmm. over a a fairly rapid period, which is now happening to Japan. Uh, Germany is not far behind. And all of the Western world, and that's what the book uh, uh, What to Expect But No One Is is Expecting was about, is what happens when we stop having kids? Is it just, oh, we're a smaller society now? And, And the answer is no, society unravels. Okay, hold on. Okay. Two things. Number one. This is the logical outcome of consumers. I'm not to harp on my thing, but listen to this. This was from the article. Are you promoting your book no, again? No, no, no. Okay. It says... He's just promoting his point of view. <laughs> my point of view. Uh, a report found that an astonishing 90% of young women in Japan believe that staying single is, quote, preferable to what they imagine marriage to be like. 90%. Wow. Because to be married, and certainly to have children, requires self-sacrifice. Right. It requires a, a suspension and, of the and, pursuit and the of your personal over desires. and over again, it's too much trouble. That's right. It's, it's I don't want to bother with I it. I would have to sacrifice something in order to have a relationship and certainly to raise kids. And you know, in a consumer society, the only thing that is wholly sacred is the pursuit of my desires. Right. Do you know where, of all the Disney theme parks in the world, do you know which one can spend the most on a new attraction? Well, the... Tokyo Disneyland. Yeah, Tokyo Disneyland. Do you know why? No. Uh, what they call shop. Because single 47-year-old men go there with their laptops. <laughs> no, just that's to not have it, a Sky. That's a good theory. <laughs> I appreciate that theory, but that's not it. Uh, shop girls. Shop girls is why. And shop girls, it's the, it's the... What are you talking it's about? It's the name of a demographic. And the demographic is young single women with lots of disposable income that love cute things. Think Hello Kitty. That is the demographic that drives Tokyo Disneyland. And they come over and over again. And so the rides, like when they built uh, Disney Tokyo Sea or Tokyo Disney Sea, was actually the most expensive per square foot Disney theme park in the world with rides that they could never afford to build in the United States. Have you been there? No, I haven't. But I've seen pictures and it's pretty cool stuff. But what what are they going to do when no children are coming to Disneyland because they don't have any children? Well, it's kind of creepy. It's for shop girls. It's for... It's for young singles. But this brings up my second point, which is we live in a global economy. And what happens to the United States, for example, when Japan is no longer economically viable or Germany, which is another huge right. economy, is no longer economically viable? Right. Because these are the countries that we trade with. We I buy know. goods from, they buy goods from us. Well, and you know, it sounds like to me... It's the end of Western civilization. <laughs> it's the end of civilization. As we know it. Not just Western, apparently. <laughs> but what, what about, um, you know, here in America, you, you can say, you know, there is a sense of pride in your people where, you know, you really don't want them to die out. It doesn't sound like they really care whether the Japanese... They don't see the People point. People or culture you remember my, continue on. R- remember my moving sidewalk illustration? How did that go? Life <laughs> is like a moving sidewalk. You get on at one end and you get off at the other end and you have no control over the speed of the moving sidewalk. But how you treat life is highly affected by what you think happens at the end of the moving sidewalk. 
And if you come to a, if you kind of walk away from religion entirely, which paints a picture, a hopeful picture. And one of the, the issues they talk about is the sense of futility that many Japanese have just mm-hmm. from generations of living in such an earthquake prone kind of disaster prone mm-hmm. uh, piece of land. Um, and, you know, with the nuclear holocaust and then the recent, uh, you know, the, the tsunami. tsunami, there's just a sense of why would I want to bring up children? Let us this? eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Yeah. Why would I want to bring mm-hmm. up? And that's, you know, the, the Christian narrative that at the end of the moving sidewalk, there is a new heaven and a new earth. You know, there is there is a, 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 the kingdom of God, and I can be a part of it now, and it will just explode into bloom when I hit the end of the moving sidewalk. That's a hopeful narrative that makes you want to have kids and raise them in that. Well, this is why I don't understand why atheists are trying to destroy, you know, that Not whole... All are. Well, yeah, but, you know, but don't, popular, don't they understand that if we just squelch out, in, you know, any possibility of God or heaven, that we're going to be like Japan? Without the cute little toys. Without the cute toys. That doesn't sound like a very fun world that I want to no, live I in. What, what amazes me is that they've taken one of the basic human instincts, mm-hmm. just biological Mm-hmm. And been able to alter it and shut it down. Are you talking about sex? Yeah, of course I am. Oh. <laughs> He's talking about sex. You know, a lot of people think that's not possible, but it actually is. It actually is. Wait, 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 it's wait. What, do you, all the what time. do you mean? Well, you know, we live in such a sexualized. Stop playing that thing. It's annoying. <laughs> we live in such a sexualized culture, and there's so much promiscuity going on, and obviously teen pregnancies and things like that. That our general perception is, well, people are just going to have sex. You can't stop it. It's not going to change. And yet, in Japan, the culture has shifted in such a way that people don't want right. to have sex. Right. Well, well, let's, maybe we should try some of that here in our high schools. <laughs> that well, it's like would be a good thing. It's hard to turn it off and turn it back on again. Yeah, you know, you like, once you squelch it, it's gone? Yeah, once you change, once you change cultural values. So are you saying we should just let what our, it, what you know, it does teenagers? Re- oh, you stop. <laughs> but what it does reveal is that sexual ethics, sexual mores, sexual norms do influence our biological yeah. instincts. And, and there's the a culture fun, there's, as an influence. There's kind us. of a humorous line in the article, they don't see the humor of it, where they say, though, you would think they would be fine with sex because they're not religious. You know, as in, mm-hmm. well, religion is what makes people not have sex. Take away, And that's that's never been true. I mean, religion has shaped sexual morals in the context right. for sexuality. Right. But man, religious people have always made more babies than the rest that's right. of that's the right. world. That's right. It's the most secular parts of the world that are having the fewest children. They're having, they yeah. may be having sex, but they're not having children. How do you sum that up? <laughs> <laughs> there aren't many babies in Japan. They'd like to make some, but they don't think they can without messing up the times. They can go to Disneyland with the shop girls or buy Hello Kitty, goodbye baby, goodbye God. I'll see you later maybe, but I think we're running to the end of Western civilization. Hey, we have to go. Sorry, but our editor has to leave because he has to go shoot his kids at some point. Thank Bye, everybody. Coming. Goodbye. <laughs>